The streets of Paris in the early 20th century were a melting pot of visionaries, rebels, and dreamers ready to challenge the status quo of society. It was a time when cultural and intellectual upheaval was sweeping through the artistic community, igniting an explosion of ideas, creativity, and rebellion against conventional norms. At the heart of this avant-garde revolution was Cubism. Before the turn of the century, artists across Europe were captivated by the Impressionist movement, which sought to capture the fleeting essence of light and atmosphere and how it interacted with their subjects. Painters like Monet, Renoir, and Degas were breaking free from traditional techniques, opting for loose brushwork and vibrant colors to represent the world in a new, more subjective manner. But as the 20th century dawned, the art world hungered for even greater innovation. From tribal masks to intricate sculptures, European artists were exposed to the bold simplicity and spiritual intensity of African artifacts, thanks to increased colonial presence and trade. This infusion of non-Western aesthetics was a potent catalyst for change, sparking a profound fascination among artists seeking to break away from traditional and naturalistic representations present in Western art at the time. Born on October 25, 1881, in Malaga, Spain, Pablo Ruiz Picasso came from a family of artists. Picasso's artistic talent was evident from a young age, and his father, a painter and art teacher, nurtured his creative spirit. At the age of 13, he studied fine arts in Barcelona, and by the age of 16, he was accepted into the prestigious Royal Academy of San Fernando in Madrid, Spain. In 1904, Picasso moved to Paris, where he was exposed to the designs of African and primitive art. He was also heavily influenced by the post-impressionist painter Paul Cézanne and his exploration of geometric forms and multiple viewpoints. These influences ultimately culminated in one of his first groundbreaking paintings in 1907, Les Demoiselles d'Avignon. This painting depicted five prostitutes from a brothel, each portrayed with sharp geometric lines and distorted shapes. The painting presented the viewer with distorted and angular forms inspired by African and Iberian art. It was both revered and controversial at the time, but it left an indelible mark on the art world. Born in 1882 in France, Georges Braque was also heavily influenced by the works of Paul Cézanne. Early in his career, Braque painted in the Fauvis style, characterized by bold colors and loose brushwork. However, it was during the time he spent studying Cézanne's work that he began to develop his distinctive artistic language. Braque admired Cézanne's ability to see beyond the surface of objects, perceiving them as a collection of geometrical forms. In his works, Braque began experimenting with the idea of multiple perspectives, breaking down objects into basic shapes, and exploring their spatial relationships. One of Braque's most renowned pieces is Houses at Lestac, painted in 1908. In this artwork, he employs Cézanne's influence to represent the houses as overlapping cubes and cylinders, transforming the traditional landscape into a complex arrangement of forms. This painting was fortunately exhibited at Daniel Henri Conviler's Paris Gallery, where a critic by the name of Louis Vaucel regarded Braque's work as reducing everything, places, and figures and houses to geometric schemas, to cubes. The year prior, in 1907, Braque met Pablo Picasso, and together they further expanded on the ideas they had borrowed from Cézanne and African influences. This collaborative effort led to the birth of analytical cubism, a groundbreaking movement that shattered traditional notions of representation and perception. Traditionally, art, ever since the Renaissance, was made to imitate a three-dimensional space viewed from a single angle, but Braque and Picasso sought a new way to convey multiple perspectives, showing objects from various angles simultaneously. Instead of depicting objects as recognizable shapes, they broke them down into smaller geometric forms like cubes, cones, and spheres. The two explored the concept of simultaneity, showing different perspectives of an object within the same painting. 
The intent was to reflect the way the human eye sees the world, not as a static, complete picture, but as a prismatic and constantly moving experience. During this phase, color took a back seat. The focus was primarily on monochromatic palettes with earthly, muted tones, allowing the audience to concentrate on the structure and the analytical process of breaking down objects. This was a stark contrast to the movements of Impressionism and Fauvism, which utilized vibrant and striking colors. Synthetic Cubism emerged around 1912 as a natural evolution of analytic Cubism. Picasso and Braque, as well as other Cubist artists like Juan Gris, felt the need to move beyond the monotony of analytic Cubism's monochromatic deconstructed forms. They began introducing new materials and techniques into their art, such as newspaper collages and stenciling. By introducing real-world materials, Cubist artists began to flatten out and remove the illusion of depth found in earlier works. However, these elements were carefully cut and pasted onto the canvas, creating a dynamic interplay between the real and the painted. Another notable difference between analytical and synthetic Cubism was the introduction of a wider, more vibrant color palette, Synthetic Cubists departed from the subdued palette of analytic Cubism and embraced a more cheerful and varied color scheme. Bright blues, reds, and yellows came to life on the canvas, injecting a sense of energy into the art. Though Pablo Picasso and George Braque were the two titans of Cubism, Cubism as an art movement, complete with its defining characteristics, would not have been so diverse and influential without the works of the Salon Cubists, a group of avant-garde French artists that built upon the early Cubist experiments of Pablo Picasso and Georges Braque, while intentionally steering a different artistic path. Artists like Albert Gleises, Jean Metzinger, Robert Delaunay, and Fernand Léger gave both analytical and synthetic Cubism its striking geometry, colors, and tessellation. One of the defining characteristics of the Salon Cubists was their willingness to write about their ideas and theories. Gleises and Metzinger co-authored Du Cubisme, a seminal text that laid out the principles and philosophy behind the movement. It provided insight into their belief in the importance of geometric order and intellectual rigor in art. Robert Delaunay, on the other hand, took the Cubist principles in a slightly different direction. He delved into Orphism, an offshoot of Cubism that emphasized the use of vibrant colors and abstract forms to evoke emotions and sensations. In his Windows Open Simultaneously series, Delaunay explored the interplay of light and color in a way that was both bold and innovative. Synthetic Cubism ended with the onset of World War I in late 1914, as many of those who made it critiqued it and consumed it were drafted for the front lines. Nonetheless, these artists still found the time to create new works of art, aiming to keep the Cubist movement alive and well. In 1915, Crystal Cubism emerged in the art scene. This movement retained some elements of traditional Cubism, such as fragmentation and multiple viewpoints, but added a new layer of complexity and transparency. French critic Maurice Reynal likened this new development in Cubism to crystals, as the art took on a more tightened and cohesive crystalline shape. Working out of neutral Spain, Juan Gris produced many of his famous works during the Great War. His works featured intricate and dynamic compositions, combining elements of Cubism with collage techniques. Grise's art played a significant role in cementing Crystal Cubism as a distinct phase in the Cubist movement. After World War I, the artists that were drafted had to return to their art practices and rebuild their lives. The returning Cubist artists stuck to their pre-war style, which seemed regressive but continued as a historical approach. The post-war climate brought about a longing for more traditional, nostalgic forms of art. People sought comfort and stability in the familiar, which led to a revival of classicism and a diminished appetite for the avant-garde. To appeal to new patrons, post-war Cubism became more classical and conservative, a return to order. Despite these efforts, Cubism's influence began to slowly fade away as the 1920s wore on. 
Picasso himself kept experimenting with different styles after the war, moving away from Cubism and into Surrealism and Neoclassicalism. Regardless, Picasso did periodically return to Cubism, notably with works like Three Musicians in 1921 and Guernica in 1937. The groundbreaking design and philosophy behind Cubism completely transformed the trajectory of modern art, paving the way for subsequent movements like abstract art, Dada, and Futurism. It shattered the boundaries of representation and laid the groundwork for artists to experiment with new forms of expression.